by Yuri Timro. Uh, again, as usual, uh, post all your questions on the Slack now, uh, since uh, we have many people that can answer there and you will get an answer for sure. Uh, and for tutors, uh, if you deem it necessary, you can invite uh, participants to join breakout rooms to give uh, uh, more detailed, uh, to give assistance about more technical uh, issues. Uh, so please, Yuri, um, with the, we proceed with the answer. Thank you, Ivan, for the introduction. Uh, hello to everybody. Uh, I'm from uh, Ecole Polytechnique Federal uh, de Lausanne uh, in Switzerland, and it's my great pleasure to be with you today or tonight. Um, so the day four, we have hands-on on advanced functionals. We have uh, also four tutors available. So I just remind that you can uh, ask questions in the breakout rooms for those who are in Zoom and for those who are on YouTube, or you can post your questions as usual. All right, so let's get started. Uh, we will do three exercises. The first one is uh, for iron oxide. You already saw this in the lecture uh, just uh, half an hour ago using DFT plus U method. Uh, second example is uh, DFT with hybrid functionals. Uh, we will see how this works uh, for silicon. And the last example is using Van der Waals functionals. Uh, and we see how this works for graphite. Uh, you can see the note below that uh, these examples can be quite heavy. This is why uh, we can use uh, allocated uh, clusters for this school. And for those who are on YouTube, they can run on the laptop or on the workstation, depends what you have. All right, so let's start with DFT plus U. A brief reminder uh, from the lecture, as Professor De Gironcoli showed, in DFT plus U, we correct the total energy, energy functional, such that we have the standard DFT expression, the DFT total energy, plus uh, the Hubbard U corrective term. So I just want to explain that this corrective term, it's already the Hubbard contribution minus the so-called double counting term. So this is one uh, final expression. And this Hubbard correction energy looks like this, where we have the effective uh, Hubbard U parameter, because this is actually uh, Hubbard U minus Wounds exchange J, so we call it one effective Hubbard U in the simplified uh, rotationally invariant formulation of DFT plus U. Uh, we have a Kronecker symbol delta M M prime, where M and M prime are magnetic quantum numbers. Also, we see here uh, object which is N, which depends on indices I sigma M M prime. Uh, index I corresponds to uh, atoms, so it labels atoms. Sigma is the spin index. It can be spin up or spin down. And this object is called uh, occupation matrix. It's defined as uh, two scalar products. One is between a uh, Konshen wave function psi, which depends on spin, uh, V, which is the band, electronic band index, and K is the key point. So scalar product between psi and phi, which are uh, localized functions. This can be, for example, uh, atomic-like functions, which are centered on atoms. And the same uh, scalar product, complex conjugated, uh, I'm sorry, not complex conjugated, but in different order, and also index M instead of M prime. And F, sigma, VK uh, are the uh, electronic occupations, for example, Fermi Dirac or anything else. Okay, and if we compute the trace of this occupation matrix, so we sum up our uh, index M and spin, we obtain a uh, object which depends only on the atomic index I. And this is nothing but the number of electrons sitting on the shell that we are trying to correct. For example, if we're applying a Hubbard U correction to the D electrons, so D shell or F electrons, F shell. So this number N of I will give us how many electrons 
are sitting on, on that shell. Finally, by knowing this expression uh, for the energy, we can obtain the uh, modified Kuhn-Sham equation. It's written below uh, by taking a functional derivative of the energy with respect to the wave function. So we obtain this modified Kuhn-Sham equation where the blue term is the standard uh, DFT uh, contributions, the kinetic energy plus the Kuhn-Sham potential. But now we have uh, extra potential in red. This is the Hubbard potential. This is the uh, derivative of E of U, this uh, Hubbard energy. And, and I didn't write here the expression for the potential, but it's, it's quite simple. And in practice, we need to solve this modi modified Kuhn-Sham equation that includes plus U correction for the D or F electrons. Okay, this was a brief reminder. Uh, now, uh, regarding the uh, localized states manifold, because on the previous slide, let me go back, I showed that there are some mysterious functions phi, which are localized functions. So what are those? So those functions are uh, the, the states that we want to correct. For example, in iron oxide that we saw in the lecture, uh, Professor de Gironcle say that the electrons are not correctly represented in LDA or GGA. So we want to correct the electrons. So those functions phi corresponds to the atomic orbitals of the electrons. And how this is implemented in quantum espresso or how to tell to the code that we want to correct the electrons of iron oxide. Uh, currently in version 6.7 of quantum espresso, this is hard coded. So it cannot be provided in the input file. So this is really hard coded uh, in the routine called set Hubbard N and set Hubbard L. So where N stands for the principal quantum number N, like in quantum mechanics, and L is the orbital quantum number. So in the case of iron, we want to correct the 3D shell. So the principal quantum number is uh, three. So N is equal to three. And the orbital quantum number is two because this corresponds to the D electrons. And this is uh, coded in these two routines. In the future versions of quantum espresso, we plan to uh, change this and allow to the user to specify uh, the manifold that we want to correct from the input. This will be much better and much more user friendly. So work is in progress, but for the time being, this is uh, hard coded. And if you want to modify this, you need to uh, modify these Fortran routines and recompi recompile the code. But we don't need uh, typically to do that, it, only in some rare cases. Okay, so uh, example one, uh, iron oxide, we start with the input file. You are already all experts in uh, input for PW calculation for the ground state calculation. So uh, I will not discuss many things, just uh, things related to uh, DFT plus U calculation. So in yellow, this is what you should know already, like uh, type of calculation is CF. Uh, experiment, we use experimental lattice parameter. This is cell DM1. We use smearing because iron oxide comes out to be metallic. It's a fake metal at the level of uh, LDA or GGA. So we know that it is metallic, so we need to use smearing. And we specify in this case, uh, this, the Marzari Vanderbilt smearing or it's called cold smearing. And also we need to specify the value of the broadening parameter for this type of smearing. In this case, it's 0 0.02 Wittberg. Typically, this is the default value, and we should use this or slightly lower. It depends on the system. And one has to carefully check this parameter. Next, um, OK, in blue, I actually, I did some uh, mis-explanation uh, before. So in blue, we show uh, the block corresponding to the magnetization. This will be described uh, in more detail uh, next week when uh, 
you will hear about introduction to the magnetism. So here we specify n spin equals to two, which means this is spin polarized uh, collinear calculation. And we need to specify two parameters starting magnetization, depending on uh, for type one and for type two. We need to specify value in the range from zero to one or from zero to minus one. In this case, we just take something like 0 0.5 and minus 0 to, uh, 0.5. So this value can be changed, but uh, in, in some cases, systems are not really sensitive to this, but in some cases, systems can be sensitive to the starting magnetization, in particular, from my knowledge, in 2D materials, uh, the solution to which you converge can depend quite a bit on this uh, starting magnetization. So one has to check carefully because there are many, in magnetic systems, there are many uh, local minima. Okay, next. Um, we have in the yellow also highlighted um, atomic species. We have two types of iron, iron one and iron two, and we use PAW projector augmented wave pseudo potentials. So why do we have two types of iron, iron one, iron two? This is basically means that we have two sub lattices in this cartoon, they are shown in red and uh, blue uh, balls. So iron one is, for example, red and iron two is blue. So we specify these two types of iron because red uh, uh, atoms have spin down and blue ones have spin up. So this is why we need to specify uh, two types. Now, coming back to uh, Hubbard specific input files. So they are actually not highlighted, but they are written here. First of all, we need to add the keyword called LDA plus U equals to true. So this is to tell to the code that we want to do DFT plus U calculation. Next, we need to specify the parameter LDA plus U kind equals to zero. This parameter can take values zero, one, or two. If it's equals to zero, it means we use DFT plus U simplified formulation in the Duderev framework. If you specify uh, one, it's a um, more full formulation uh, according to Liechtenstein, it, which, which is, can also be non-collinear. And you can have also J parameter in that case. And a uh, more recent addition in quantum espresso is a uh, two which is uh, DFT plus U plus V, wh where V is the uh, inter-site correction. Th this was not mentioned in the lecture. I have some slides about this. I will discuss in more detail later. But for the time being, just keep in mind that we do a simplified DFT plus U calculation. So we set zero. Then uh, U projection type. Uh, this is very important point because in DFT plus U, as I said before, we have localized functions phi. So these functions can be different. I mean, uh, and depending on which functions you choose, the value of u also can be adapted or I will explain it can be computed. But basically these functions phi are uh, controlled by u projection type. This is the type of the Hubbard manifold or the Hubbard projections. In quantum espresso, there are a few options. One is atomic, corresponding to at atomic-like functions. So this corresponds to uh, atomic orbitals read from the pseudo potentials. So in pseudo potentials, you have information about atomic orbitals of uh, uh, an atom of iron. So basically we take d orbitals of iron in this case. Another option is uh, orthoatomic. So as you can guess, ortho means orthogonalized. So what we do in that case, we take atomic orbitals of iron and we orthogonalize them between different sites, also including uh, oxygens. And it's even possible to use uh, Vanier functions. This is less developed for the time being, and this is working in progress. So typically we have atomic and orthoatomic options. And even though here it's written uh, atomic, 
but for production purposes it is recommended to use orthotomic because it's from our experience it gives more accurate results uh, and finally we need to specify the value of the hubbard u parameter effective hubbard u parameter in this case uh, this is a trick we essentially put it equals to zero because we want to do a pb sol calculation in this case so without hubbard u correction but we put it some very small number just to uh, activate the uh, DFT plus U machinery. Because when you use DFT plus U, the code prints extra information in the output file. So we want to see this extra information when we don't have uh, U correction. So that's why we just activate all flags, but in, 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 uh, essentially we are not applying any U correction. So we're just trying to, uh, to cheat the code. And we specify two values of Hubbard U parameters, one uh, corresponding to iron one and second corresponding to iron two. In this case, they are e equal. But if you say, for example, have a system which contains different uh, elements from the periodic table, for example, iron, nickel, cobalt, and other elements, of course, each element needs different Hubbard U correction. So you need to specify them here. But in this specific case of iron oxide, we have two types of iron, but both are iron. So uh, if these atoms are uh, crystallographically equivalent, the Hubbard U should be the same. But if for some reason uh, there is some complex distortion, low symmetry, and these two types of iron become crystallographically inequivalent, then we need to apply uh, most likely different Hubbard U parameter. And the question is how to find those parameters. Uh, it's a big problem. It was a problem in, until some time ago, but now we have first principles method, which allows us to compute those Hubbard parameters for any element, any material at hand. So this is no longer an issue. I will talk in, uh, about this in more detail in a moment. Okay, so uh, another interesting point is that I would like to let you know about the so-called quantum espresso input generator, because I've just discussed the input for iron oxide, and during the first three days you learned a lot about how to set up the input, how to choose key points, uh, cutoffs, that you need to perform conversions tests. That was the routine uh, maybe like 10, 20 years ago and earlier. But nowadays, we want to improve and make it more uh, automatic. So for this reason, it was created a quantum espresso input generator. The link to this tool is, uh, is below. So the goal of this tool is that it provides to you a first initial guess of the input. So what you can do, you can upload the crystal structure. This can be the input file that you just prepared, but let's say you don't have a lot of experience in setting up all those parameters. So you do something uh, that you, you learned, but then you want to verify if that is a good uh, initial setup or not. You just upload it here. And this tool will provide you on the input, the suggested parameters for key points, for cutoffs, pseudo potentials. Or if you don't have input file, you can upload C file or any other formats you can choose. Then, um, yeah, this is exactly the parser, the file format that you upload. Then the pseudo potentials, I will mention in the next slide. You already heard a lot about pseudo potentials that there are norm conserving, ultra soft, projector augmented wave. But again, which one to choose? Uh, if you are a beginner, you can be lost and uh, don't know what to do. But nowadays we have a standardized uh, library, it's called SSP. So basically, no, no longer a problem. You just go there and pick up pseudo potential for the element you need. Next, you need to know, uh, preferably, the, the, the type of your system. Is it a, a metallic or insulating? Is it magnetic or magnetic? So of course, it's not easy to tell, but maybe you know it from the literature or some other source, but you need 
to provide this information as an initial guess. And then uh, you specify uh, the density for the, of key point grid. So it's not the grid directly like two by two by two or four by four by four, but it's rather the uh, density, uh, sorry, the distance between key points in the reciprocal space in the brilliant zone. So in this case, for example, we want to tell that, please uh, tell me which K point grid I need to use in order to have the uh, distance between nearest K points of 0.21 over angstrom. And this will give you the accuracy of 0.2 EV on, on the energies. And this corresponds to the fine grid. But then there are other two options which give more uh, denser uh, K meshes. So this can be controlled here. And of course, depending on your structure, you have different size of the unit cell. So for the small cell, you need more K points in the brilliant zone because the brilliant zone is larger. Instead, if your unit cell is large in real space, so the brilliant zone will be small, so you need less K points. So with this QE input generator, it can provide you the uh, good initial guess for the input parameters. But of course, uh, you should to verify that you just need to still do some checks, convergence checks on key points, decrease it a little bit, increase, and see that it's really a uh, good suggestion by the tool. And speaking of uh, SSP library, uh, the link is below. But again, this is very well tested uh, pseudo potentials. So, what was done? people from uh, Lausanne, from EPFL, from the group where I work now, they took uh, different pseudo-potential libraries existing and they compared all of them. So th many properties were computed like phonons, uh, total energies and many, many other properties. And this, for each pseudo-potential, all these properties were com compared with all electron calculations that do not use pseudo potentials at all. So that is a reference. And by doing this comparison, uh, we pick up the best performing and the most accurate pseudo potentials. So if you need some pseudo potential, for example, iron, we see magenta color and oxygen, also magenta. So actually I don't have it on my slide, but this corresponds to some specific pseudo potential library, which is, uh, PS library generated by uh, Andrea Del Corso using the atomic code that is included in Quantum Express. But if you take some other element, for example, nickel and uh, again, oxygen. So oxygen is from one library and nickel from another library. All right, let's move on. Coming back to DFT plus U. Before we discuss the input for the uh, SCF calculation, self consistent field calculation. And this is the input for the uh, NSCF, non-self-consistent calculation. We consider this input because we want to compute projected density of states. So as you learned already, first we need to do SCF calculation and then NSCF calculation. And here uh, many things are the same, actually exactly the same as an SCF. Just in yellow, I highlight that we need to add a number of bands. In this case, it's 35. So we didn't specify this parameter in the SCF input because in the SCF, the code will compute just uh, occupied states for insulators and for metals, it computes occupied states plus 20% of uh, empty states. So since iron oxide is a metal, we add smearing. So we have not only occupied states, but a little bit of empty states and partially occupied states. But here we, since I already checked before that I want to include a bit more uh, that was already computed. So we add a bit more empty states. So this is why we have 35, but for each system, this, this should be checked, must be checked. And also here we use denser K point grid because in the SCF, we use three by three by three. And here we use six by six by six because NSCF is much cheaper so we can use denser K point grids. Uh, but be, uh, uh, notice that these parameters are not converged. This is just for the demonstration purposes. So of course you need to carefully check uh, the convergence 
of the calculation with respect to K points and even cutoff, of course, cutoffs, they are also very low. Okay, so SCF and SCF, and the last point is calculation of the PDOS. This is the input file. Uh, we specify a type of smearing, Gaussian in this case, the broadening for this uh, Gaussian function, which is in Rydberg units, not electron volts, and the energy range in which we want to plot the projected density of states and the delta E is the step. And once this is done, we will use the GNU plot script. It's called plot pdos.gp to plot the spectrum. Okay, so now let's uh, do perform calculations. Okay. So now we're back to the virtual machine. We are in day four, example one dot DFT plus U. So any questions so far? If anything, you can either unmute yourself or... You can raise your hand also. Yes. Okay, if not, let's uh, move on. So, as I mentioned before, we will use uh, HPC facilities for this exercise because it's quite heavy. In this repository and day one, in example one, you click on readme.md and these are the instructions. So you can proceed on your own and I will try to proceed as well. So we have three parts. One is standard DFT calculation, second DFT plus U, and third calculation of Hubbard U. So let's do the first step. Okay. Okay, let's use uh, HPC. Now, let me remind, uh, if you, in case you missed it or you forgot, if you click on Mozilla uh, browser, here there is a button called how slash two. Okay, you click on it, then you choose uh, remote access usage. And you scroll down and these are the commands remote MPI run to submit the calculation with the default number of cores, which is 20. And we will use a remote SQ to monitor the execution of, of the calculation. So please do not uh, open the output file when the, the job is running. So just submit the calculation and monitor the execution with remote SQ. And then we copy file to our uh, virtual machine. So let's do that. So we type remote MPI run, then pw.x minus input, and the name of the input file. This is FEO iron oxide dot SCF dot in. Okay, so the job was successfully submitted. Now let's see what's happening. We type remote underscore SQ, press enter. Okay, so the job is running already 10 seconds. It should be very fast calculation. This is standard DFT calculation. Still running. Okay, while waiting, there is a question on uh, YouTube. How is the double counting correction implemented? So there are different types of uh, double counting. And in quantum espresso, one of them is implemented. It's called fully localized limit. Next, uh, missing SSP PP from different libraries. 
uh, mixing, sorry, mixing to the potential from different libraries. Is it okay? And different norm conserving ultra soft PW. Yes, this is okay. You can mix pseudo potential from different libraries and if even different types of pseudo potentials. You can use norm conserving and with ultra soft. What you cannot do is to mix functionals. For example, for iron, you use LDA and for octane, you use uh, PBE. So that is not as possible. But as long as you use one functional, you can mix pseudos. Okay, this calculation should be finished. Okay, now let's copy the file from the cluster here on the on the local machine. So this is done by rsync underscore from underscore HPC and we do quotes star dot out enter. Okay, copied files. And we have this network. We can open uh, the file P, uh, output file pw dot if iron oxide dot scf dot out. Okay, you're already familiar with the output. Let me just highlight what is new with respect to in DFT plus with respect to DFT. So I just re remind that this is. DFT calculation, but we activated the DFT plus U machinery just to print some extra output, but the U correction is actually zero. So what is in particularly interesting is that at the end of the uh, so consistency, uh, the DFT plus U machinery prints some uh, information about the occupation matrix. So let me recall what is this. The occupation matrix is this object n i sigma m m prime. So this is a matrix, okay, with respect to m m prime. In the case of iron, we are considering 3D electrons. So uh, the orbital quantum number is two. So the size of the matrix with respect to m m prime is five by five. Okay, so this is a five by five matrix and we can uh, take compute the trace of this matrix so take the sum of the diagonal elements and this will give us number of electrons in this 3d shell what we can do we can also diagonalize this five by five matrix and obtain its eigenvalues which can also tell us uh, what's happening in the system so let's see where, where is this so in the output we see the trace of the occupation matrix. This matrix is called NS. NA is the uh, atomic index. So we take the trace of this five by five matrix and we have for the spin up, for the spin down contribution and the total, which is spin ups plus spin down. For the spin up, we see we have 4.98. So this is the number of electrons in the spin up channel of the 3D electrons of iron. And this is number of electrons, which is 1.8 in the spin down channel for the D electrons of iron. And if you take the sum, you get 6.78 electrons overall in the 3D shell. So we know that roughly almost seven electrons on the 3D shell, not exactly seven, but around seven. But this is not a very um, accurate estimate because we use atomic projectors. So it's better to use orthoatomic projectors, which will give more uh, physically meaningful value for the number of electrons. And you can compare, uh, you can um, determine the oxidation state of, of iron oxide. I mean, if since oxygen is two minus, so iron is two plus. So you can count electrons and see what, what you should expect. So for atom one, this is uh, information about number of electrons, spin up, spin down, chain on the total. And these are the eigenvalues. This is what I said before. When you diagonalize the five by five matrix, you obtain five eigenvalues. So on the diagonal, you have five eigenvalues. So we see that all of them are almost one, so which are fully occupied. And also you have eigenvectors. 
And so this is for the spin one, which is spin up. And for spin two, which is spin down, you see that in the, in the uh, spin down channel, instead of one, we have some fractional occupation. So we see that those uh, are partially occupied. So when it's one, it's fully occupied. When it's zero, it's fully empty. So here we have partial occupancy in the spin down channel. And, uh, and then for the second atom, because we have second iron, we have the same information, uh, number of electrons, it's actually reversed. So in the spin up channel, we have 1.8 in the spin down 4.98, but the sum is the same 6.7 as before. And now again, here we have some uh, reversed uh, picture. So in this spin one, we have fractional occupancies in the spin down, fully occupied. Okay, now uh, let's continue. Now we do the NSCF calculation, same way. So we do remote MPI run PW.X, uh, read the input. Now we add N to CF and we execute. Okay, let's check if it runs properly. Yes, it works. Okay, still running. Okay, one question uh, by a colleague of mine, Nikita, about we can see LDA plus U parameters, but to the potentials are PB sol. Is it okay? Yes, uh, we are using PB sol functional because uh, this is three dimensional uh, crystal. So for bulk systems, we, we should use PB sol uh, GGA functional. Why PB? So because PB sol, I mean, sol stands for solids. So PB sol was optimized for solids, while PB that was optimized for uh, molecules. So PB should be, well, historically PB was created before PB sol. That's why people applied also PB in uh, solids, but PB sol is now developed. So we should use PB sol for solids. Uh, Yuri, we have also one uh, raised hand. Uh, yeah. Will uh, you you want to answer now or? Yeah, yes, now it's okay. Okay, so let me activate the microphone. Yes, please, uh, Samira. Now you should be enabled. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, please, uh, why did you uh, do this step uh, remote uh, uh, in the beginning and the now? This is my question. Sorry, uh, what? what? Yeah, the, the audio were, uh, was not very uh, smooth. Uh, could you please uh, tell it again? Maybe it's lower and don't speak too close to the microphone, maybe. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning and sorry for uh, the interruption. Uh, my question is, uh, why uh, did you uh, write remote in the terminal in the beginning? I, I didn't get the question. Ivan, did you understand? Uh, why did you uh, something uh, in the terminal at the beginning? I didn't get just uh, the, the middle word. Uh, the, the command, the command remote. Ah, remote. Remote. Yeah. Remote. Ah, okay. Uh, no, thank you. Now it's clear. Okay. Okay. So thank this you, is okay. Remote underscore MPI run. So this is the special command uh, created for this school because. Uh, we are using the cluster. So when we execute this command, what happens underneath is that the calculation is submitted in the cluster. So not on your computer, so via SSH, uh, the message is passed to the cluster, one of three clusters that we use. And there, there are local scripts on the cluster which are submitted and the calculation is run there. So, I mean, if you're connected directly to the cluster, you're using uh, MPI run or uh, other analogs on the, on the HPCs. 
But here we have a special command for this school, uh, which does more than just that. It, it simplifies our life a lot. So just with this simple uh, command, you, you submit calculation. That's it. So this was explained uh, yesterday. All right. Um, thank you, Samira. And thank you, Yuri, of course. Uh, we have uh, questions from streaming. Uh, do you want me to read them or uh, you read yourself from the yeah, chat? Let's, no, please, please. Let's answer one more and then maybe we uh, uh, answer uh, others later. Okay, so uh, the first one from streaming is uh, mixing SSSP pseudo potential from different libraries. Is it okay? Or if different uh, non conserving uh, uh, PAW on uh, Ultrasoft? Yeah, yeah, this actually has already answered. Uh, it, it's possible to mix it. Yeah. Okay, the next one is how is the double counting correction implemented? Also answered, uh, fully localized limit. <laughs> um, maybe the last ones. Um, uh, how, how we can read the eigenvectors for each eigenvalue by row or column? Uh, this is. <laughs> okay. And uh, the last one, how should they give uh, F, uh, Fe1, Fe2 for inequivalent atoms? And the last one, what difficulties can NBE calculation have in magnetic systems applied DFT plus U? Okay, regarding the eigenvectors, uh, I mean, I never really used those inf that information about eigenvectors. And that's why uh, I cannot answer, is it by row or by column? But this can be easily verified by checking the code. So I, I will check this and I will answer on Slack. Okay, so this I will answer later. Next. Uh, yeah, maybe Yuri, because the, the, the guy who posted this question is on uh, oh. YouTube streaming. Oh yeah, so I will- So you know. cannot get the answer by Slack. So maybe yes. we can answer uh, later on uh, during the end on, or maybe even uh, in uh, tomorrow or in um, voice because- Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know the, the name of the routine. I mean, if you're familiar with Fortran, you can check. So I write on YouTube, pw slash src slash write underscore ns dot f90 to check. Um, so pw src write underscore ns. Write underscore ns. Yeah, there you can see how it's printed. Dot F90, right? Yeah. Okay, so I, I, I have just written in the YouTube uh, stream channel, so you yeah. can check there. Yeah. Okay, next question. Should I give iron one, iron two for inequivalent atoms? Yes. So in this case, uh, we use iron one, iron two because of spin, because we want to have one spin up, spin down, but these are still equivalent. If it happens that you know, we have just two iron in the in the our simulation cell, but if you take some uh, other polymorph of iron oxide which has bigger cell, so you have more than two iron atoms, it can happen that not only you need to define two types of iron because of spin, but it can happen that even there are some uh, crystallographic inequivalence between irons. So you can you can define maybe more, more types of iron. So by, by playing this trick of different types of iron, you can control spin and uh, also in, in equivalence between atoms. So you can have iron one, iron two, iron three, iron four. First two correspond to spin up, spin down, they're equivalent and iron three, iron four also spin up, spin down, but they are another set of uh, inequivalent atoms. And last question, what difficulties can, what is NBE? Can be uh, calculation? Maybe they mean the NAB and the EB. Ah, NAB. Uh, I, I guess, I don't know. It's... Sorry, I don't understand that question. So maybe William Selin, uh, maybe you could uh, uh, repost the, the question uh, in, on the YouTube uh, screen. 
so uh, yeah, it's yeah. Okay, there is also a question. Uh, PB soil is better for 2D materials than PB. Um, so in our group, we use PB for 2D materials because PB is for let's say molecules. PB is solved for solids. 2D is in between. So uh, there is a question: uh, Is it PB or PB soil? Well, uh, from my knowledge, uh, people use typically PB, but uh, you should compare PB and PB soil just to be safe. Okay, and Stefano uh, answered: Eigenvectors are by column from lowest to highest, the same ordered the eigenvalues. Okay, thank you. Okay, just to move on because I'm super late. So we did SCF and NSCF. Now the last step is a calculation of the PDOS. So we type remote MPI run. P, uh, it's called projwfc.x minus input. And we type the name of the input file, which is projwfc ion oxide input. Meet remote SQ already finished. Yes, takes a uh, few seconds. Now we need to copy files. Let's do this way rsync from HPC dot. So we copy everything because I don't remember the names of files. And there are many actually. So this should copy all files from the cluster to my local machine. So we see that the PDOS calculation produced uh, many files, each of them corresponding to specific type of uh, orbitals. So for example, these S electrons of iron, then you have P electrons of iron, D electrons of iron. So what we want, we want to plot uh, figure which we saw in the lecture for iron oxide. So we want to plot uh, D, D states for iron one, uh, D states for iron two, and P states of oxygen and see how this looks. So for this, we have a uh, script. Where is it? It's called plot underscore PDOS GP. So you just type GNU plot and the name of the script. So let's do that. GNU plot, the name of the script. Okay. So this produced file called iron oxide underscore PDOS. Oops. Now let's visualize this. Okay, so we use uh, this common atrial. So you should obtain this. I, I guess many of you already obtained it uh, half an hour ago because you're faster. But this is in fact what we saw in the lecture. So the vertical axis is the projected density of states, horizontal axis is the energy minus Fermi energy. So our zero corresponds to the Fermi level. We see uh, in green, sorry, in red, iron 3D majority spin. So we have, in fact, they are uh, fully occupied because we saw that eigenvalues are one, essentially one. So we see they are all occupied. And for the other iron uh, minority spin in green, we see that uh, they are around the Fermi level because they, we saw that eigenvalues were not one, but they were some fractional numbers between zero and one. And for oxygen, we have blue um, PDOS, which is also mainly occupied. So this is a problem of standard DFT with LDA or PBE or PB. So now we want to apply the plus U correction so to do that, 
Um, sorry. So you follow, not this one. So in the extractions of this exercise, you do step two, you add the value of the ABR new parameter, which is 4.6. And all the rest is the same, but you just repeat steps that you saw before. SCF and SCF, projected density of states. Okay, so, and I will not do that in the interest of time. So let's see what is the final result. Yeah, okay. So on the left is our DFT result, on the right is the DFT plus two result. So when we apply the Hubbard U correction, so what happens is that we apply the, uh, we remove self interactions for the D electrons. So they were uh, delocalized in uh, PB sol, but by putting plus U correction, we are localizing them more as they should be. And when we do the self consistent cycle, what happens is that the calculation converges to the insulating ground state. So we have a band gap now. And in fact, this agrees with the experimental observation that iron oxide is an uh, insulator. So this is good news. Uh, so plus your correction works. Now the question, very interesting question, and it's the main uh, problem of the DFT plus your method. Why and how to choose the value of the Hubbard U parameter why did we use 4.6 electron volts? So 4.6 EV, we use just an example for demonstration purposes. But what we need to do in practice, we need to find the value of the U parameter somehow. So what people, many people typically do, they use empirical value by trying to reproduce, for example, the value of the band gap. For example, you know that in iron oxide, there should be band gap. I don't remember the experimental value. Let's say, uh, I, I don't want to say some random number, but some value, and we want to reproduce that value as close as possible, but we can try different values of Hubbard U parameter, and we can pick up that one, which gives us the best bang gap. So this is what many people do. However, this is not a very satisfactory approach because uh, first of all, uh, DFT plus U is not really the method for uh, computing very accurately the band gap. DFT plus U is the method to uh, correct the energetics of the system, to, to remove self-interaction and to have uh, correct energetics of the system. Band gap is a spectral property because you need to go to, you need to have conduction states, uh, so on and so forth. So trying to reproduce experimental band gap is already not really the best way to go. But uh, the, the better choice is to compute Hubbard U using first principles methods. There are different methods. Uh, Professor De Giron uh, explained that there is linear response method, but there are also others like constrained uh, random phase approximation and some other methods. So in this, in this slide, I would like to tell a few words more about linear response. And also as Professor De Gironcoli mentioned uh, recently, we recast this uh, theory or formulation in a more uh, computationally efficient way using density functional perturbation theory that was initially developed for phonons, which will be discussed tomorrow by Professor Baroni. So DFPT was created in uh, around in the late 80s. The first paper was in 1987 for phonons. Then in 1991, uh, very extended physical review B paper by Professor Gianozzi, Professor Baroni, Stefano De Gironcoli, and uh, uh, Andrea Del Corso, or maybe I'm wrong. And then there is a review paper in 2001, if I'm not wrong. But you will learn tomorrow about DFPT. This is a very powerful uh, theory. And we use this uh, intelligent idea 
also for this problem of computing Hubbard U parameter. It's quite uh, theoretically involved, so I will not discuss here. Just to say that U is defined is the, in this way, where chi and chi naught are so-called response matrices, which can be computed by, compu by obtaining the response of our occupation matrix to some perturbation with the strength of the perturbation lambda. Uh, and in this DFPT framework, this object is defined as the sum over Q points over uh, this uh, complex object delta N of Q. So unfortunately, I don't have time to explain in detail, but the message to pass is that uh, there is some Q point sampling of the Blinan zone and each Q point, Q, Q vector, if you want, corresponds to the uh, wave vector of the perturbation, so-called monochromatic perturbation. So we have several monochromatic perturbations, and for each of those perturbations, we compute the linear response of the system. By summing up all, all responses, we obtain the, the total response from which we obtain the value of Hubbard U parameter. So physically, what we do, in our system, uh, we apply some um, perturbation to the occu electronic occupations, for example, in 3D shell of Pyron. So we perturb slightly the uh, electronic occupations in the 3D shell and see how the system responds to this. And from this response, we can obtain the value of the Hubbard U parameter. And how to compute it with Quantum Express? So uh, there is a recent, a recent code called HP, standing for Hubbard parameters, that implements this idea using density functional perturbation theory. The input is very simple. You just provide prefix and uh, output directory if needed, and the Q-point grid, which I mentioned. In this case, it's simply one by one by one to make it fast. But in practice, you need to converge the value of Hubbard U parameter with respect to this Q-mesh. So Q mesh and also K point mesh. So U, U value must be converged. So, in, uh, I, so this is why we use 4.6, because uh, if we compute Hubbard U for iron oxide using Q mesh 111 and K mesh 333, we obtain 4.6. But of course, this is not converged. So this cannot be used for production purposes, but this is just for demonstration purposes. And um, Yuri, sorry, there is a, a question which I think is pertinent regarding the calculation of Hubbard, Hubbard uh, parameter. Yeah. And that is uh, if there are uh, if there is an easy way to determine range a range for if there is a range for the the U value. So yeah, if there is an upper bound for um, up, is there any upper limit of U value? No, no, there is any constraint. And in fact, if uh, this method is not suitable for closed shell systems, so when the D electrons, D shell is fully occupied, in that case, this method gives unphysically large Hubbard U parameters. It can be 20 V, 50 V, uh, unphysically large. So this method is not suited for closed shell system, only for open shell systems where the electrons are partially occupied, like in iron oxide. And also, since we're talking about questions, there was a question on uh, a Slack or in Zoom, I don't remember. So because uh, some participants says that the U parameter is applied for to six S states in some system. And that was done using empirical U to reproduce the experimental band gap. So question was, can we apply U to S states? or even to P states. So typically, U correction was uh, introduced, uh, as was explained, going from the Hubbard model when there is a problem of strong correlation. So historically, LDA plus U and or DFT plus U was used for correcting D electrons and F electrons. But then later, people realized that actually, when you introduce the Hubbard correction in the framework of DFT, 
it actually cures uh, self-interactions and not correlations. Correlation problem is very complicated problem, strong correlations. You need a uh, multi-determinant uh, theory and there are symmetry uh, uh, arguments. It's, it's very complicated problem. So the DFT plus U is not uh, the theory to cure strong correlations. It's, it's really curing self-interactions. And self-interactions are present not only for D and F electrons, they are also present for P electrons and S electrons, for all types of electrons. They are larger for D and F electrons and they are smaller for S and P. So in principle, why not apply U to P states or even S states? And in fact, in the literature, some groups apply U correction to the P states of oxygen, for example. Uh, this is not, there is no general consensus on, on this point, but this is what, what people do. Uh, so, but putting you on, on P states uh, is, well, this is, has to be discussed. For the S electrons, it's even, even more uh, questionable, uh, but then people do what they want. Uh, you apply to S6S, S, you try to reproduce experimental band gap, yeah, I mean, uh, don't know what to say. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's basically the comment. But to move on, uh, we can compute the Hubbard U parameter. Let's do that quickly. So this is explained in point three. You can skip the step of cleaning temporary directory. So what we need to do is to run the SCF calculation as before and running the HP code, hp.x, uh, read this input. So, so since we're running on the cluster, we don't need to add this uh, name of the output file. And instead of this symbol, we need to put minus I N P or minus I N. So let's do that. So we do remote MPI run W dot X minus input. And the name of the input file PW dot iron oxide SCF input. remote sq to check the hp calculation will be much longer than the pw calculation because pw is the ground state calculation while hp is the linear response calculation it can be 20 times uh, longer it depends on the system it depends on the then to the Q point grid and other things. Okay, so SCF is finished. Now let's submit um, the HP calculation. So MPI, oh, sorry, remote MPI run, hp.x, and the name of the input, it's uh, hp.ironoxide.in. Uh, uh, sorry, Yuri, may I say, just, just interrupt you one minute. Sure. Sure. Uh, okay, uh, for the people that is running on the CISA cluster, please, before uh, launching, uh, starting jobs, remote jobs, please run the update, uh, update, uh, update uh, reservation name, uh, CISA, uh, update CISA reservation name command as it is in the instructions in the how to. Because if you don't do that, you, uh, you run the jobs in the queue of all the users, not in, your res not in the reservation for the school. And so, uh, first of all, you remain in queue without the job executing. And second thing, you occupy nodes that are not reserved for the school. So please uh, just read the, the instructions in the how to, uh, how to remote and follow the instruction for CISA. This must be done uh, uh, 
every morning before starting the 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 end zone. Sorry for the interruption and the inconvenience. Okay. Thank, thank you. Okay, the calculation is finished. Let's copy it here. So we do our sync from HPC dots. Okay, and um, we can check the output file. Well, HP calculation will produce file called ironoxide.abarparameters.dot. So we can uh, open it. And in this file, you see information about the Hubbard U parameter, which was computed. And we see that, in fact, for iron 1, the U value is 4.655. And for iron 2, it's exactly the same value. So we obtain exactly the same value for two irons. And because they are crystallographically equivalent, they just differ by spin, but this doesn't mean that you should be different because of spin. There can be spin resolved Hubbard U, but this is uh, also work in progress. For the time being, we have global U for both uh, spins. Okay, now a couple of questions before we go to the second ex example about the hybrid functionals. We have Ignacio with the race done. Can we answer it? Yes, question? please, please. So let me... Um, thank you. So on this issue of calculating U for orbitals other than 3D and 4F, I was thinking about these projectors that you have or these inner products between the bands and the atomic wave functions. And my question is, is there a problem um, if the wave functions that we use are actually pseudo wave functions which don't have nodes? Okay. No, it's not a problem. So we use, in fact, pseudo wave functions. Um, so for the conscious wave functions, we have pseudo wave functions, and we project them on uh, the 3D atomic orbitals of iron. So no, there is no any problem there. So we don't need the information about core electrons of uh, for the conscious wave functions because. In Consham uh, wave functions, we have just valence electrons, which which uh, make the chemistry. So we project those on uh, 3D electrons. But and excuse me, if you were to project uh, the Consham orbitals over um, atomic orbitals which have nodes, but you are actually approximating those with pseudo atomic orbitals that don't have nodes. Oh, okay, yeah. That, that was the question, if that could become a problem or, or not. Ah, okay, sorry, yes, so we, are, we were referring to atomic orbitals. No, no, it's, it's not a problem. No issue. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Then uh, other comments? Uh, yes, we have another from Samir. Uh, sir, uh, my question is, uh, did we uh, need to modify the input before uh, doing uh, uh, the second calculation, uh, uh, the calculation of a U parameter? Because uh, when I check now the input uh, that we have in the day, uh, day four, uh, there isn't uh, the value of uh, U and the input. Okay. Yeah, so in this example, there is a note that before running the SCF calculation, you need to initialize back Hubbard U to uh, 10 to the power minus eight. Yeah. To start from the uh, PB sole ground state. I think what you did, you forgot to do this. So I guess in your SCF input, you still have 4.6, correct? Okay. I think so. I will and check. So what happened is that in your test, you use 4.6. So this means actually your ground state calculation is DFT plus U. And from this ground state, you compute the Hubbard U and it's different. And this is expected. So this is another important point that actually I was not planning to discuss, but this is important. Um, so we need to do uh, self-consistency when we compute the Hubbard U. 
So what does this mean? When we compute Hubbard U from the DFT ground state, so with U equals to zero, what happens is that our ground state is completely wrong. It's metallic. And so from this completely wrong ground state, we obtain U 4.6. If we repeat this step again, we put uh, in our SCF, the value we just computed 4.6, we redo the ground state calculation with DFT plus U, and we open the gap. So now, we're, now our ground state is way better than before. Now we have insulating ground state, which is much closer to the truth. And starting from this improved ground state, we compute again the Hubbard U and you obtain something maybe five or six EV. I don't know what did you obtain. So what we do next, we use this updated value of U and we plug it in again in the SCF calculation. So we redo again the DFT plus U ground state equation and recompute U again. So we do this so-called cell consistency loop until Hubbard U does not change. So this way uh, we obtain the self-consistent uh, value of the Hubbard U parameter. If we do just one shot, it, it's called one shot calculation. You just do DFT and on top you compute U that is not the value you should use for production purpose. You need to do it uh, self-consistently. Moreover, there is an external loop of self-consistency for the geometry. So to go even further, what we do, we not only compute U self-consistently, we also relax, optimize our structure in the external loop. So we do this double loop for the structure and calculation of U until the value of the Hubbard U does not change and until geometry does not change. So this is very important because um, your Hubbard U is consistent with the geometry. And, and that is that, that value of U that you obtain and that geometry that you obtain should be used for the production purposes. There is a paper we published in uh, this year in January in physical review B that discusses this point. So you see DFT plus U is quite tricky when you start working on it. It's not just picking up some random U or empirical U, run in calculation and publish something. It's, uh, there is a lot of uh, details that you should be aware. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, if you can uh, let us uh, the title of the, the paper. Yeah, I will um, write it on Slack and uh, on YouTube. Uh, it's physical you, review B, uh, 2021, where I am the, the first author, so we can uh, Google it. Okay, next. Uh, Thank you, Samira. We have uh, uh, four, which might be reduced to condense uh, to three questions from uh, streaming and uh, another raised hand. Would you like to proceed uh, to answer? Yeah, the point is that we have a uh, little time. We have 15 minutes, correct? And then we have another half an hour. Can we use that half an hour? Uh, well, we have, uh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, no, we have until 12.30. Uh, uh, OK, so, so yeah, we, we have 45 minutes. OK, left. OK, because DFT plus U was initially for half an hour, but now it's uh, one hour and 15 minutes. Yeah, okay, uh, so let's answer a few questions. Just, just do as you want. You, sure, you, no, if no. you want to. This is, this is my uh, favorite topic, so I can continue forever. So, <laughs> so then, um, so, okay, let me explain the last thing and then again questions and we, we move on. Okay. Because I, I mentioned about DFT plus U plus V, this is extended formulation where uh, we have not only the uh, Hubbard U correction, which is uh, on site, so we're correcting electronic interaction, interaction sitting on, on iron atom. But also we're adding another contribution, actually subtracting another contribution, which depends on the uh, V parameter, which depends on two indices, I and J. And this is the so-called intersite interaction. So in the case of iron oxide, this extra contribution will correct interaction between 3D electrons on iron and 2p electrons on oxygen. So this is why it's called intersite or interatomic inter interactions. And 
in this cartoon, we see that in DFT, 3D electrons are over delocalized. In DFT plus U, we are putting plus U correction. So it's a penalty. We are localizing electrons, so they become uh, less spread and sharper. And in DFT plus U plus V, in fact, we apply plus U to make it sharper, so to localize 3D electrons. But we also take into account the effect of ligands. We know that there are oxygens. Oh, well, this is not the, the right structure, but we know that there are oxygens around iron. So, and 2p electrons of oxygen interact with 3D electrons of iron. So we take into account that interactions and we correct that. So this, is, this extended functional gives more flexibility and this functional allows us to correct not only the localization problem of 3D electrons, but also correct the interactions with ligand states. So this general formulation is very powerful. And uh, from our experience, DFT plus U compared to hybrids, because some people asked if DFT plus U is better than hybrid functionals or GW. So DFT plus U um, is worse than hybrids. Sometimes they are quite compare well, but sometimes hybrids are superior to DFT plus U. And if you use this extended formulation, DFT plus U plus V, this extended formulation is, uh, gives much closer results to hybrid functionals. But it is important to remember that we should not take hybrid functionals as a reference because hybrid functionals are also approximate. You have uh, a fraction of exact exchange, which is 25% in PB0 and uh, HSE06. But uh, hybrid functionals also fail in solids because this fraction of exact exchange is not uh, proper, not correct. So there are more advanced hybrid functionals. They're called dielectric the dependent, developed in the group of uh, Julia Galli in Chicago and uh, other works by Kronik and other groups. So they choose the uh, fraction of exact exchange ab initio. So they compute it. Actually, I will discuss about this soon, but to sum up, to summarize, standard hybrids like PB0, HSC06, they're also not perfect for solids and taking them as a reference is not always a good idea. But in some test cases that we considered from our experience, DFT plus U plus V is uh, in good agreement with, with hybrids or sometimes even uh, superior. Okay, um, and to, to, to finish, not only U but also V can be computed using the HP code in Quantum Espresso using uh, the latest version. Okay, before we, we move on, let's answer a few questions on uh, this first part. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we have two questions from streaming, uh, which are related. We can plot the density of state of sub, sub bands, maybe sub bands of sub -bands. D orbitals. I mean, D, X, Y, Y, Z, 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 Y. And another related, how can we plot the EG and the T2G states? Okay, so for the first one, yes, we can plot different contributions. You just need to open this file. Let me try to do that. Not sure this works. Okay, so one, and then five. Okay, if you open this uh, file produced in the P dot calculation, uh, it doesn't want to fit. So we do view, zoom out. Okay, in the P dot file, you see uh, lots of numbers. There are many columns. The first column is the energy. Second and third are uh, local density of states for the up, spin up, and for the spin down. So this is what we plot actually in this uh, example. Could plot for the spin up and spin down. But if you are interested in really uh, contributions 
uh, to this uh, local density of states of this dxy, dyz, dzy, etc. So these are, I highlighted them. For the spin up channel, we have five, of course, because this is the D shell. And for the spin down, we have five as well. Also, in the, at the end of the PDOS output file, where is it? Should be proj output. At the end of this file, there's a useful information, so called uh, loading charges. So for atom one, you see lots of interesting information, and what you're asking is essentially there. So for the spin up, d electrons, you see dz squared, dxz, dyz, etc. So you see those numbers, and you can identify and plot them using the file I showed before. And regarding uh, T2G, EG, this is not uh, explicitly written anywhere. So, and actually I have also troubles to uh, identify what is what. So we need to plot these contributions and uh, analyze a little bit the results to identify where is T2G, where is the G. But you don't have something uh, explicitly written T2G or EG in the output. But th I think this information is uh, in enough to, to obtain what you need. And then um, what else? Another one from streaming uh, hp.x uh, code. Calculate upper parameters for the atoms that have upper parameter assigned in the SCF calculation, right? What mm -hmm. if I wrongly assign uh, upper parameter for O in the SCF file? Uh, so the last question, what if I wrongly assigned upper parameter for oxygen? What does it mean? If you wrongly assigned, well, you will obtain wrong results. Say, I, I maybe I not didn't get the question right, but I mean, if yeah, maybe need... it can be if you want to write uh, if you write the morad, maybe write uh, reformulate it on YouTube so Yuri can answer more precisely. Just to. And Comment. So, for example, for iron, we put 4.6 and uh, 4.6. And for oxygen, we put how about you three? So, we put three because oxygen is uh, type number three in the atomic species list. And for oxygen, we put uh, the value we compute or we, we want. Okay. So next, uh, is it better to use DFT plus U plus V to evaluate D band center? Not sure I understand the question. And don't understand what does it mean, evaluate D band center? So again, here maybe. Uh, yeah, uh, then the question can the U parameter, U value be different according to the applied to the potential? Yes. The Hubbard U parameter is uh, depends on pseudo potentials, depends on the Hubbard manifold, if it's atomic or orthoatomic, depends on the oxidation state. So yeah, when you report value of the Hubbard U in your paper, always remember to report which pseudo potentials did you use, which functional, which Hubbard manifold, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, so that people can reproduce your results. Otherwise, if you just report uh, U equals five EV and that's it, that's not enough. Not satisfactory. Okay. Uh, how okay. DFT plus U is better from TBMBJ? Uh, fortunately, uh, I don't know. I don't have experience with that functional. Is there a way to determine the G factor of transition metals of radicals using QE? Though that is not related to this uh, hands-on. 
Okay, so there is a question about hybrids, but let's uh, discuss it in the next part. We have also to raise the end if yeah. you want. So we have uh, half an hour and we have still hybrid functionals and wonder was so let's continue. So actually they are shorter, so they should be 15 minutes each. Okay, so let's go to hybrid functionals, example two. And apologies for those questions that uh, I couldn't answer now. So presentation, hybrid functions. Okay, this is the slide uh, to remind what you saw in the lecture. Because uh, in hybrid functional, there is this problem of divergence for the Q plus G when it, it's uh, zero in the summation. Uh, so there is a, a Q mesh in uh, hybrid functionals. So what the meaning of this Q mesh? In the expression for the uh, exact exchange energy, there is a double sum over bands and key points. And that is very expensive, uh, having this double sum over key points. So to reduce the computational cost, one of the key point sums is uh, replaced by uh, sum over Q points, which is uh, has less Q points than in the original K point summation. For example, if you have a double sum of K over K points and each of these sums runs from one to 100. So we have 100 times 100 terms. That is a lot. So what we do, we say the following. The first k point sum we keep from one to 100, and the second k point summation we replace by q points from one to, to 10, for example. So basically, we are reducing the second sum of our k points using this trick of q points. Okay, so this is the meaning of q points. And there is this singularity problem. There are different ways how to treat this singularity problem. And the one was mentioned in the lecture is the so-called GG Balderesky. I think it was, uh, if I'm not wrong, it was created in Lausanne in Switzerland and uh, published in this work. So we will use this correction method to treat the divergence so, uh, in, in this um, example. The, the input file for silicon with hybrid functionals is shown on this slide. Uh, in yellow, I highlight input parameters related to a hybrid functional. What we need to specify is the keyword called input underscore DFT yeah, equals to the name of the hybrid functional that we want to use. In this example, we use PB0 functional, hybrid functional. So we write PB0. If you want to use B3Lib, you write here B3Lib and uh, HSE, respectively. It is important uh, to notice that when you select pseudo potentials, you need to use those uh, which are with, generated with the functional, which is as close as possible to your hybrid function. So this means that if you use PB0, you need to use pseudo potential generated using the PB functional. You should not use LDA functional in this case because you're using PB0. Uh, unfortunately, nowadays we don't have pseudo potentials generated with hybrid functional. So this is why people use uh, pseudo potential, pseudo potentials generated with PB or PB sol functional or LDA. Next, we specify the Q-point grid, these parameters NQX1, NQX2, NQX3. So we use just one Q-point. Uh, so we write one by one by one. So this is really uh, the simplest approximation we can do, which just say there is one Q-point, just gamma. Then uh, we need to set up X gamma extrapolation to true. This means that we are uh, taking care of the this divergence singularity problem when Q goes to zero. If you set it to false, you basically don't uh, 
take care of that and it will be much slower convergence. And then uh, EXX divergence treatment, we specify the GG Balderesky method. Uh, as was explained in the lecture, there are other methods, for example, uh, spherical cutoff of the Coulomb potential. And there is also uh, for anisotropic systems, so-called Wigner Zeitz, Zeitz uh, truncation. So it's not spherical in all directions. It depends on the, if it's anisotropic in one direction, it's longer, in another, it's shorter. So it takes into account this. Okay, but uh, spherical cutoff and, uh, and Wigner Zeitz cutoff, they are not supporting uh, non-cubic uh, systems, if, if I'm not wrong. Okay, uh, this is just to remind that there are several types of hybrid functionals. And uh, different treatments of the divergence in the hybrid functional. Gigi Balderesky, spherical cutoff, and uh, cutoff for anisotropic supercells. And if you specify none, then uh, sets Coulomb potential simply to zero, but this is not uh, really the best way to go unless you are using this uh, specific type of hybrid, which is GAUPB, which is not that uh, popular actually. Okay, and now uh, we need to do the exercise. We need to run a hybrid functional calculation with PB0 for bulk silicon. We need and we need to compare the total energy using different uh, Q-point meshes and see how the total energy converges as the size of the Q-point mesh. So I remind that we're using here a simplification when we replace the one summation over key points by summation over Q points, but this is an approximation and we need to be sure that we are not making a big error there. So we need to make some convergence tests using uh, or not using the extrapolation uh, at the gamma point. Okay, so let's do this exercise during um, 10 minutes and the remaining 15 minutes we use for van der Waals. So hybrid functional calculations are uh, extremely expensive. Currently in quantum espresso, uh, there is an efficient implementation for uh, the case of norm conserving pseudo potentials. And Ivan is an expert in this. He implemented very uh, efficient uh, recent method called ASE, correct? Uh, he's an expert, so if you have questions. Yeah, yes. The method was uh, proposed by Lin Lin, and then uh, we implemented it in uh, Quantum Express. So it's based on a projection of the exit exchange operator on the manifold. Yes, and this uh, speed ups calculation by which factor, more or less? Uh, it depends on the systems. We, we registered up to seven. It depends on cases. If you compare with the very old previous implementation, is uh, even a uh, an order of magnitude. Uh, whereas in other cases, it can be three, four, five, yes, but still uh, it is uh, significant, let's say. In fact, now it is the default method. Exactly. So thanks to Ivan, uh, you can now run uh, hybrid functional calculations very effectively and efficiently. Uh, instead for uh, ultra soft pseudo potentials and projector augmented wave, uh, is this supported, your implementation even? Uh, okay. Yes, it is uh, supported, yes, it is. Okay, okay. But just notice that in the case of ultra soft and PAW pseudo potentials in hybrids, there is a, a less, let's say li more limited support. I mean, some things you cannot do like, it's first of all, it's a bit quite slow and also certain things cannot be done. I think it's like stress, uh, forces, things like that. I don't remember by heart, but for non-conserving, there are more things you can do than you can do with ultra soft and PAW. So I would suggest probably to try first with non-conserving and, um, and then you can also try to explore ultra soft and PAW. 
Okay. Um, yeah. So you you use the HPC for this case. Type as usual remote MPI run. pw.x minus input and the name of the input file and you submit. Okay, while waiting, um, one important comment for, hy for hybrid functional calculations is uh, there are some tricks. So if we go, oh, actually I should not do that. We go to pw.x input. There is parameter called Apologies. E cut folk. Um, where is it? I mean, on the virtual machine, I have some issues. If I try to use some, uh, you see, uh, some comments. Basically, there is a parameter. E yeah, there was there. I, I saw it. Where is it? It is the second line. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. So there is parameter called if cut fork. Um, the default value is the same as e cut raw. So this is for you remember normal conserving to the potentials e cut raw is four times larger than uh, the kinetic energy cutoff for the wave functions. And ultra soft and PW is eight times larger. So E cut fork is also like equals to E cut row by default. But you can significantly speed up the calculation by uh, using E cut fork value. For example, you can start to setting it equal to E cut WFC. But uh, I think if I'm not wrong, you should use maybe a factor of 1.5 or 2. Or something like that to to have uh, reasonable accuracy. So E cut fork value can be can take values between E cut WFC the minimum value, and the default one is E cut row. But just keep in mind if it's very expensive computation, you can reduce this E cut fork uh, parameter. Okay, remote is two. That was gamma point, so it's finished. So we need to do calculation for uh, different key point meshes. We don't have time to do that. That's why we just see this result. And in fact, we see that using X gamma extrapolation true, we reach the convergence faster for uh, small Q point meshes. So already at gamma, this dot, this point is uh, closer to the converged value, this one, if we use a gamma extrapolation technique. If you don't, you're more off with respect to the converged value. For the Q-mesh two by two by two, again, you see improvement when you use uh, extrapolation, but uh, let's say it's smaller. And then for the Q-mesh four by four by four, it becomes almost negligible and at, at eight, you're already at convergence, eight, eight, eight. So that's why it's recommended to use a extrapolation technique to, to allow, allow us to use uh, scarcer Q meshes. Okay, so th this is it for hybrid functionals. Let's try to discuss, uh, answer some questions if we can. Uh, we have Palon Unko. Please. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I have a question concerning the ECAT fork. So yep. you said yep. that it will speed up the calculation, right? Uh, I want to know if it doesn't affect the, the, the total energy and something like that. Okay. Yeah. So it affects. So that's why you, you need to also check carefully. Uh, the value of the ECAT fork. So when you reduce it to the value of uh, ECAT WFC, this cutoff for the wave functions, so this is the, the minimum value of the ECAT fork. But be careful because perhaps in your system, this uh, simplification can uh, 
lead to some uh, quite big errors in the total energy and other properties. So this is why always before production calculations, before publishing the results, as everything else, you always have to perform convergence tests and checks. So this parameter has to be used with care. Mm, okay, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, then from uh, Slack, there was a question about hybrids. How um, can we modify the exact exchange mixing parameter in the hybrid functional? Also, can we modify the screening parameter present in the HSE functional? So the mixing parameter we can modify from the input. Don't recall the name of, the, of it. Uh, Ivan, do you remember the name of this mixing? Um, so there is some parameter. Screening parameter. Screening parameter. Okay, let me uh, open it here. So, oh. Thank you, Pietro. So where is it? If I'm not wrong, it's something uh, X, X, yeah. Here it is, yeah. Fraction, so, X, X fraction. Uh, here, this one, no screening parameter. Uh, this is screening parameter for HSE like hybrid functions. Yeah, there are two questions. Exit exchange mixing parameter, I guess it is X uh, fraction. Yeah, and the one other is one exactly. is uh, screening. Exactly, so apologies. Yeah, so the, uh, the fraction of exact exchange is, I mean, it's called exact exchange fraction. Here it is, so we can change it. And the screening parameter is specific to HSE. So since we're talking about this, I already opened uh, some papers for dialectic dependent uh, hybrid functions from the Galli group. So what they said that this parameter alpha is actually related to the dialectic constant of your material. It's one over epsilon. So, and of course, in different solids, the dielectric constant is different. But using global value of 0 .20, 0 0.25 is not always working well for all solids. So for those solids where one over epsilon is close to 0 0.25, which should give quite good results. But for other solids where the electric function one over epsilon infinity is quite far away from 0 0.25 then, standard hybrids most likely will not give satisfactory results. So you can tune this fraction of exact exchange by, by computing it like one over the electric constant. You can go further and do even more advanced things. And this is done in another paper by the same group. So instead of using equation five, where you have alpha one over epsilon infinity, you can use more sophisticated expression uh, in equation seven, which is then used in equation six, uh, which is this uh, screened Coulomb potential. So in this expression for W, it's not simply one over epsilon infinity. It's more complicated function uh, where you use a complementary error function. It's sort of a modeled uh, expression for the screen Coulomb. It has interesting properties that if you take the limit when R goes to R zero or R prime, so basically uh, two points are close to each other. In this limit, it gives you uh, simply one over R minus R prime. But if you are going in the limit one R minus R, R prime in, it goes to infinity, it gives you one over epsilon infinity. Basically the first term survives in the limit when R minus R, R prime goes to infinity. And in a limit when R minus R prime goes to zero. Uh, so this term survives. I don't remember the details. I worked on this uh, five years ago, but basically if you take the two limits, you should reproduce uh, the, the expected behavior of uh, 
of the screening of the Coulomb potential. But these features, I think they are not implemented in quantum express currently. But these dielectric dependent hybrid functions are very popular nowadays, becoming more and more popular uh, for solids. So you can check the literature. Okay, uh, and let's say last 15 minutes for Van der Waals. But before we go, maybe one more question, if there is any. Uh, yes, Dorie Esteras. Uh... Hello, uh, thank you for your clear explanations and for answering our questions. I was thinking how to extract the Hubbard potential matrix you saw us at the beginning. Could we, uh, can we do this uh, using the STF matrices present in the output or is something more? I mean the, the occupation matrix and the projectors. Uh, apologies, I didn't understand fully your question. So. You are asking about occupation matrix uh, in the output? Yes. Um, can we construct uh, the Hubbard potential, a, a Hamiltonian term, for example, to use it in a tie binding using okay. this occupation matrix? Oh, okay. Um, I don't have experience with this, but um, I, I think something can be done, of course. But I don't have experience with uh, doing what you suggest using uh, constructing the binding Hamiltonian on top of DFT plus two results. But I think, yeah, yeah, I would say yes. Okay, may I ask this in a Slack? Then. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you too. Okay, so let's move on. For Van der Waals functions in graphite. So in this example, last one of this uh, hands-on, we consider graphite because it has a layered uh, structure. We have layers and between these layers, we have uh, Van der Waals weak interactions. The experimental value of the interlayer distance is 3.3336 uh, angstrom. If you try to use a standard LDA or GGA exchange collection functional, you will not obtain satisfactory results because uh, uh, LDA underestimates and GGA overestimates interatomic distances. And we will compute those distances in this uh, example. So that's why here we need to use uh, Van der Waals corrections. So how to do that with quantum express? You need to specify, there are two ways how to do that, depending on which type of uh, about correction you use, semi-empirical or, uh, or other ab initio. So you need to specify parameter input underscore DFT uh, Van der Waals slash DF. This is just one kind of uh, Van der Waals correction. There was a question earlier about Van der Waals kernel. In earlier versions of Quantum Espresso, you need to generate the Van der Waals kernel, no, not in this case, in others, so like RVV10, and then uh, do the calculation. But in the latest versions of Quantum Espresso, this kernel is generated on the fly. And so you don't need to worry about that. And uh, Similarly to hybrid functionals, when you choose a pseudo potential, it must be the closest GGA uh, be, because there are currently no pseudo potentials uh, for non local functionals. So, this is why uh, also you need to choose uh, pseudo potentials wisely. So, in the previous slide, I showed that we can activate uh, Van der Waals correction with input DFT keyword, but also you can uh, do that using a different keyword, Van der Waals underscore correction. And there are different types like uh, Grim uh, D2. There are several ways you can specify it. It's known as DFT slash D or Grim slash D2. Then there is Grim D3 or DFT D3, uh, tkachenko Scheffler, where these coefficients C C six coefficients are computed from first principles. 
while in the first two they are symmetrical and this x dm and in this example uh, unfortunately we don't have time to do it now but you can do it uh, after the ending uh, of this hands-on session what you can try to do is to perform these seven calculations by in the first five you uh, activate the van der Waals correction in different ways the first three using uh, the keyword input DF dft this is our non-local non uh, flavor and the fourth and the fifth one are using the keyword van der Waals correction dftd and dftd3 these are semi-empirical so in the first three cases it's really the functional that you are uh, changing because input dft keyword con controls the functional while the fourth and the fifth one are, are just um, uh, corrections that are done at, at the end of the cf calculation so that's why we have two different keywords which might be confusing uh, for some of you and point six and seven are standard PBE and LDA calculations. And so what you need to do uh, using uh, what you learned uh, yesterday for the structural optimization, uh, so-called VC relax, you need to do the VC relax calculation in these seven uh, ways. And then for the converged optimized structure, you need to determine the interlayer distances using x cris then, for example. By doing so, you should obtain something like that. So the vertical axis is the interlayer distance, and the horizontal axis is the method we are using, actually the functional or correction, Van der Waals correction. And the last two are standard uh, PBELDA functionals. And the height of each bar corresponds to the value of the interlayer distance in graphite. And the horizontal dashed line is experimental value. So we can see that there are big variations depending on the uh, correcting uh, scheme. For example, we see uh, the first two overestimated, uh, RBB10, which is actually uh, uh, Stefano de Gironcoli worked on this about uh, 10 years ago. And this is also supported in the phonon code, which we'll discuss tomorrow. So the third uh, is RVV10, which is, it seems to be the closest to the experimental value. And DFTD is uh, largely underestimating it. DFTD3 is uh, second best result. And we see, as we as I said before, PB largely overestimates inter, interlayer distance while LDA underestimates. But we see interestingly that DFTD is even worse than LDA. This is uh, quite uh, interesting and surprising, at least to me. But uh, notice that these results are not uh, carefully conversed because, of course, we use scars key point mesh low cutoff uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. so these results should be uh, considered as not fully uh, converged so you should uh, really converge them very well to be sure on the performance of each correcting scheme but at least it gives you uh, an idea that you see uh, big variations depending on which uh, van der waals uh, correction you choose so that's why, uh, as far as I know, there is no one uh, single uh, Van der Waals scheme, which is the best and everybody should use only that one. So what people typically do, they test uh, several ones and see which ones perform the best for the system of interest and they continue working with that. But uh, please correct me if uh, you have more experience and uh, this was not totally correct. Okay, so I would say uh, the remaining five minutes we can uh, use to discuss, uh, maybe answer some questions. There is one question from streaming. What is the difference between input DFT and Van der Waals score in the relaxation? 
And if we mention them in the same time in the input, what will happen? Okay, so the, I think I already uh, explained the difference between input DFT and Van der Waals correction. Because in the first one, input DFT, you're really uh, changing the functional because input DFT controls the functional. We use this input uh, DFT parameter also to specify hybrid functional. You remember we said input DFT equals PB0. So it's really the functional that you're uh, changing. While here, uh, four and five, uh, Van der Waals correction, these are post-processing corrections. At the end of the uh, PB calculation, you just apply some uh, post-processing correction to your uh, total energy and forces and stresses. Okay, yeah, so uh, Ivan uh, Girotto said that there are many questions on YouTube. Uh, we apologize that we cannot answer all of them. Yes, some of them yeah. uh, we are trying to answer. The, the questions we can uh, maybe with a, as, as a short uh, answer, we, we are doing it. Okay. Uh, if someone else has, uh, want to raise the hand uh, for some more questions, please. There uh, one, sorry, there is also one question on Slack, or if there is someone who wants to ask uh, now on Zoom. Okay, so on Slack, there is. So we use Van der Waals to get the interlayer distance right. Would the Van der Waals correction also affect the in plane? latest parameters. In, the experience, in my experience, semi-empirical Van der Waals also shrinks the in-plane lattice parameter, giving a worse result than the in-plane lattice parameters with GGA. Is that a common effect? Would it also be this, the case with Van der Waals functionals? Uh, actually, I don't have experience with that. Maybe Stefan de Gironkuli can answer if he's still around. If not, if not, then we will uh, reply later. Okay, I know it was explained, but in case of HSE functional, which to the potential is best to choose? So I would recommend to use uh, pseudo potentials from the SSP library but all of them are ultra soft and uh, project augmented wave. However, I explained before that for hybrids, we sh well, I would go for non-conserving first. So it's a, uh, yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, maybe you can try to start, you can start with SSP library and try to use ultra soft and PAW if, this is not working well. You can try norm conserving pseudo potentials. There are two libraries for norm conserving pseudo potentials that I know are very good. One is called pseudo dojo, uh, developed by a Belgian group. So pseudo dojo. So this is a norm conserving pseudo potential. So you can try them. And then there is another lab, norm conserving potential lab. It's called SG15. Okay, and you can also try them out for hybrids. Next, uh, does the E cut fork parameter uh, potential? No, sorry. Ah, pseudo, is it? Pseudo potential dependent E cut fog parameter? Uh, the answer is no. E cut fog is agnostic to pseudo potentials. So it's just, some, it just uh, related to Fourier transform. So it doesn't matter. And uh, well, you, of course, for changing pseudo potentials, you can, you should check E cut fog. And maybe in some cases, uh, ICAT-FOC is smaller, in others it's larger. So uh, ICAT-FOC indeed is sensitive to pseudo potentials, but it's not explicitly dependent somehow. Okay, in order to choose 
In order to choose the best Van der Waals correction that represents best the interaction between a substrate and a metallic slab, shall I proceed like in example three, following the best correction that brings the lattice parameter of the pure metallic material closer to the experimental value? Uh, my answer is yes. But again, uh, you can also ask uh, Professor Dojironkoli, maybe he has a more extended uh, answer. I would try several flavors and see uh, which one is the best. Same for hybrids. You have PB0, you have HSE. Well, uh, a priori, you cannot tell which is the best. Uh, commonly, people use HSE, but uh, also you can try PB0 and others. So the same for GGA uh, functionals, there is PB, PB sol, and tons of other functionals. Uh, some are the most popular, but of course you can test different ones and choose the best ones for your system. Okay, so I think uh, we should stop here. Uh, we can continue the discussion on Slack. If you still have some questions, we will try to answer all of them or the majority of them. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yuri. Thank you. So let me just say one more thing. Of course, we uh, meet again tomorrow uh, at 8.30 uh, for Stefano Baroni will explain density functional perturbation theory. And uh, another recommendation, if you don't have the last version of Zoom, uh, you might find useful to update it uh, because uh, it uh, might be that uh, the breakout rooms uh, might uh, work better on the on the last version. So yes. Yeah.